We're in Rewired Part 5. I'm going to jump right in. I only got halfway through the message last, last service. We want to welcome everybody. If this is your first time here at Encounter Church, we pray that you've been warmly welcomed uh, out on the parking lot, in the lobby, when you came in here as well. And we pray that you'll be encouraged today by God's word and what you'll hear from his word, by his presence, most importantly. And we do want to welcome you. Our online friends, we want to welcome you as well. Rewire part five. If you would, let's go right to the screens. Everybody shout this out loud. We're going to do it three times. So maybe by the third time, you'll, you'll get the courage to join us and shout it out loud. Romans chapter 12, verse two goes like this. Here we go, ready? Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, Romans 12, 2. We'll add that at the end. Here we go. Let's do it again. Ready? Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, Romans 12, 2. Last time. Here we go. You already? Here we go. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, Romans 12, 2. I don't know if you can hear that online, but they're shouting it at the top of their lungs here. So we're going to be talking about rewiring your mind for true love, for true love. You know, Disney talks about finding true love. But what is it about love that causes it to be true? Here it is. It's because it's love based on honesty, based on eternal truth. That's how we take it in the Bible. And God's love is true love. You could call it truthful love, honest love. Love And when it's true love, it is based on truth. And so we're going to be talking about rewiring our mind. We talked the first two weeks in this series on rewiring our hearts. Remember that? And then uh, we had Unite Conference, and then Champ came in and, and spoke on rewiring our soul. Or actually, I spoke on the first part of rewiring your mind. And he spoke on rewiring your soul last Sunday. This will be the, the last half of rewiring your mind. And then Bitsy's coming in to culminate the, the refresh, the Women's Refresh Conference next Sunday, and she's going to close out this series talking about, from Scripture, rewiring your relationships, or, or you could say rewiring your family. Rewiring, man, don't miss that. Don't miss, most of y'all, you know the whole church shows up when Bitsy speaks. <laughs> I don't know why they don't, but anyway, it's good to see y'all. <laughs> anyway, maybe I talk too much. Anyway, so today we're going to dive into rewiring your mind for true love. What does true love look like? What does true love feel like? How does God define and demonstrate his true love to you, to us? You see, we have got to rewire our minds to know the difference, to be able to recognize the difference between God's true love and dysfunctional, unhealthy, counterfeit kinds of love. I want you to repeat this after me. God is love. Now turn to your neighbor and say, God is love. And neighbor, turn back and tell your neighbor, God is love. It, and, and that's so true. The Bible teaches that. It is kind of in the fabric of our ethic. It's in the fabric of our country, right, of a culture of our country. But, but there's a big difference between saying God is love and love is God. Love is not God. Love is not God. God is love, but love is not God because God is so much more than love. God is so, so much more than love. God's love, I'm talking about the foundational character of God today becoming your foundation, the foundational character of love that God has. That's the, the number one quality, the character attribute of God at his core, at his foundation. I'm talking about that foundational character of God becoming your foundation in your marriage, at your workplace, students at your school with your friends, with your family, in all your relationship, in fact, in all facets of your life, God's love becoming the foundation of who you are and how you act towards others. There's no other true love other than God's love. There is no truer love than God's love. God's love is active. It's active. It's always going, always seeking, always pursuing, always running after. God's love is active. His love is active in your life, whether you can see it at times or not. His love is active. He takes action on your behalf. Let's look at a few verses in God's word where he tells us and he also shows us how his love is demonstrated. Romans chapter 8 says this, verse 8, 38 and 39. 
You can see it on the screen. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels or principalities, nor powers or things present or things to come, nor height nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from what church? The love of God, which is in who? Christ Jesus. That's some pretty potent stuff. There is nothing that can overcome, push back on the love of God in existence. It's the love of God, which is found in and through Christ Jesus our Lord. Here's one, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. We're going to come back to this verse later on in the message. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. Wait a second. I'm sitting here breathing. I'm standing here breathing. You're thinking, I'm still living. No, 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 you're not. Spiritually speaking, you're not. We'll get into that later in the message. So it says, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who did what? Who loved me, and in his love, it acted, right? And because it acted, what did it do? He gave himself for me, right? And so this is God demonstrating the kind of love that he has for you. He loves you, and he gave himself for you. Everybody knows this. Let's say this one out, out loud. It's on the screens, John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Here again is this God who's giving, who's giving, who's giving. Let's look at Psalm 86, 15. It says this. But you, Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Abounding means it's limitless. He doesn't hesitate. It's inexhaustible. The resource, the supply of God's love never, never, ever runs out. How many of you wives wish that your husband's love was like that, that it would never run out? But there are days when you wonder, how many husbands wish that wives had inexhaustible kind of love? And there's days that you wonder because it's only when it's God's love through you that you have an inexhaustible resource. And when you try to operate in your own strength, you come up short every single time. We do. We do. Here's one, Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. Here's God's motive. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. He's motivated by his love. Everything he does for you, on your behalf, he is motivated because he loves you. He loves you. Here's one, Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still falling short of his standard, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What a demonstration of love and power. Here's one, 1 Corinthians 16, 14. Let all that you do be done in love. All, everything. When you eat lunch, do it in love. Well, how do you eat lunch in love? Well, get up and do the dishes afterwards. Right? That's if you're eating home, right? If you're eating a restaurant, make sure you tip and give a, give a, a gospel track. Right? It, everything that you do... Do it in love. So it makes it really, really important to know what God's true love is if we're supposed to do everything in love. Here's one, John 13, 34. So now Jesus says, I'm giving you a new commandment, love each other. That's the new commandment, love each other. Okay, but how? Just as I have loved you, that's how you should love each other. That's the new command. Because see, there's a lot of different kinds of love. There's a tremendous amount of love. And I dare say that the majority of us here today have not, when we were growing up especially, experienced much of God's true love. Whether it's sibling loving one another, whether it's husbands and wives loving one another, whether it's a family loving one another, friends loving one another, tell me, how should you love each other just as what? Christ loves us, Right? Just like Jesus, just as I've loved you. And how did Jesus love you? Well, let's go to the next verse, Ephesians 5.25. Here's another verse about loving. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. 
It's a selfless, sacrificial kind of love. And listen, as you follow Jesus, he'll begin to rewire how you think about his love, how you take in and understand his love. And it's so important that this becomes rewired in us. One of the most important ways he'll rewire your mind is in the area of true love. Listen, God is a lover. God's a lover. In fact, God's the best lover. There's nothing or no one that can compare. God is the best lover, so he's a giver. Because every great lover is a sacrificial giver. If they don't have the capacity to give sacrificially, then they have yet to experience God's true love. Because it's only through experiencing on a regular basis God's true love through your life that you can sustain an intimate, vital, vibrant relationship. So God is a lover. He's the best lover. And he's a giver. In 2 Corinthians 5.19, the Bible says that God in Christ or through Christ reconciled, reconnected the world to himself. He gave himself through Jesus to reconnect us back to himself. God's love gives. Healthy, true love gives. If you're dating someone and they don't have the capacity to give, that's unhealthy love. If you're giving and giving and giving and they're not giving back, that's dysfunctional, unhealthy, counterfeit kind of love. That is not God's love. Let me ask, what if you were raised in a home where your parents were not capable or willing to give of themselves like this? What if you were raised in a home with hurt? And listen, when someone is in a dysfunctional family is a parent, most of the time, the majority of the time, it's because they have been hurt themselves. We have countless young men and young women here in this county who have not been raised experiencing on a regular basis the love of God. What they've been experiencing is something so much shorter and so much less. It's counterfeit, dysfunctional, and unhealthy. And because they experienced that and they were hurt in the process... The cycle continues and spins on. That's what they had modeled for them. That's what they know. So what if you were raised in a home with hurt, selfish, self-centered parents? The results of being raised in a home where you experience unhealthy, dysfunctional, counterfeit love can be devastating which is why it's all the more important that you allow God now in your generation to break the cycle in your life, that you allow God to rewire your mind so you can come to know his true, deep, lasting love. Because here's one of the bottom lines of the message this morning. Get this if you don't get anything else. How you were loved, how you were loved, determines a lot about how you view yourself today. How you were loved as you were growing up determines so much of how you view yourself today, which is why it's essential that you come to know God's love towards you, who he is, and oh, how much he loves you and how he specifically, uniquely loves you. When we started part one of rewiring re, uh, your mind, I, I referred to a book, and I normally don't do like a book review in the, in the middle of the message, but today we're going to do a little bit of a book review, and then we're going to jump back into the message. In, in this book, pages 72, excerpts through 74, called Could It Be This Simple, A Biblical Model for Healing the Mind, Dr. Timothy Jennings, who's a, a PhD clinical psychologist that, that is a, a phenomenal uh, believer in Jesus Christ. He's got quite the uh, believing worldview. He says this, all children desire parental approval and validation. Would you agree with that? Do all children, raise your hand if you agree with that. All children, do they desire parental approval and validation, affirmation, things like that? I think so. But I'd take it a step farther. I would say it's not just children. I mean, I'm an adult now. I'm 54. Wait, am I 54? No, I'm 55. I'm 55 now. I just, last week, I forgot already. We try to forget those things as quick as we can, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Once you pass the threshold of 50, especially. I'm 55, and I can tell you every day of my life, moment by moment throughout the day, 
I desire affirmation and approval and self-worth and validation and all these things. So as an adult, and I figure if I desire those things and crave those things, I'm sure you all probably do. You know what I'm saying? And so it's not just children, so I'd say adults as well. So all children, all adults desire approval, validation, affirmation, somebody to cheer them on, to praise them, right? But yet in dysfunctional families, however, the desire for affirmation from the parents does not get gratified or delivered, you could say, in healthy ways. The basic dysfunction, listen, is this. Here's the bottom line. The basic dysfunction in these families, in these relationships is unopposed, and that's an important word, unopposed selfishness. Let me read what Dr. Jennings said again. The basic dysfunction is unopposed selfishness in the parent that results in the parents seeking to get parental needs met from the child. It's supposed to be the opposite way around. But when that, when that parent as a child never got their needs met, and that child had to act as the parent because the parent was a child, that's all they know. That's all they know. So the basic dysfunction is unopposed selfishness in the parent that results in the parent seeking to get parental needs met from the child rather than seeking to sacrifice themselves to meet the needs of the child. See, selfishness, the Bible teaches, is an attitude of being concerned with one's own interest above the interest of others. It's the exact opposite of God's love. It flips God's love completely 180 degrees up on its head. God's love is giving, self-sacrificing, other-centered kind of love. But, but in, a, in, in an unhealthy kind of counterfeit love, it's exactly the opposite. God's kind of love commands us to do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also the interests of others, Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4. It's interesting to note in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, that these verses that Paul compares selfishness to empty conceit, and that word could be translated vanity or arrogance. And so this word refers to an overly high opinion of oneself. Selfishness then is very much like narcissism. Selfishness or empty conceit is often expressed by building up oneself while tearing down someone else. I'll give an example. Uh, two Wednesdays ago, I was teaching the middle school boys uh, because Champ had gotten sick and Jacob was on a, a hot date with his, with his wife. I don't know, where's Jacob? Is he, there he is. Yeah, you're yeah, right, Jacob. Yeah. And so, and so uh, they, they got the pastor and said, hey, can you cover this base? And so I was teaching middle school boys about love. And I was saying, you have a, some great soil, real moist and good, and you have a nice clay pot that was really expensive, and you have some sunshine, you have just enough rain and water, right? And you have the best seed that money can buy, and what do you have? They're like, I don't know. What do you have? So what do you think's missing? If you put it all together, what do you have? Yeah, yeah, these guys were there, right? And, uh, and what was missing was, was time. Because until time takes place, all it is infatuation. It's not love yet, right? And so we're teaching on love and stuff. And this young man raises his hand and he says, my dad said I'll amount to nothing. But I'll never become anything good. And I'm summarizing, paraphrasing. It struck me in the heart because so many of those young men in that room were afraid to vocalize that, but they felt it. It got quiet when he said that. So let me ask you, what measure of God's love, not dysfunctional love, but what measure of God's love are your children and your grandchildren experiencing in your home environment. Oh, God, man, it got quiet in here, didn't it? Listen, what you've got to fight with all your life against, believers, is taking and leaving the presence of the Lord here in our corporate time of worship and not taking it into your home. And every day, every morning, 
every afternoon, every evening, when, if you got home from work, dad or mom, whatever your structure, whatever your schedule is, you're constantly building them up in the faith about how great our God is. Look what he did in our family, and you're expressing and sharing the amazing things. And if the amazing things of God are out of sight and out of mind in your family, then you are training your children with a counterfeit kind of love. Be careful. Some of y'all are, are guests. I, I've got seven kids. They range from 13 to 30. So I've got a little bit of experience in this area, my wife and I do. In the most important thing that you build into their life, whether you believe in Jesus or not, is God's love. It is foundational. It is the only thing that can break through the counterfeit imitations. The only thing. It is the only thing that will break through the dysfunctional addiction, no matter what it is. It's the only person who has the power to change that when he raises that person to life. We talked about this part one, renewing the mind. We talked about all these 12-step programs. And two key hallmarks of every 12-step program, number one is self-awareness. And that's called meeting Jesus Christ and giving your life to them, to him. Becoming self-aware that you're a sinner, that you fall short of God's standard of perfection. But Christ came and was perfect for us, died on the cross, was buried, rose again on your behalf, and gave you his perfect life covered you in his perfection. So when the Father looks at you, he doesn't see your shortcomings anymore. He doesn't see mine. He sees the perfect life of Christ covering you. Some of y'all grew up in church singing some crazy hymns about the blood of Jesus. The blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary. You know, all that thing. The blood is symbolic. It's symbolic of the kind of life that Jesus has, the perfect life. All through the Old Testament, the blood is a symbol of the perfect life to come in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And when he came and you give him your life and he places you in Christ, the Father looks at you and sees Jesus all over you. <laughs> he doesn't see you anymore. You're in Christ. And the Bible teaches for those who are in Christ Jesus, there is therefore now no condemnation, not one ounce. So why are you condemning yourself? God never designed the believer's life to live burdened down with shame and guilt. He designed the believer's life so that we could walk in freedom. What does it mean to step into a relationship with Jesus Christ? It means that you have believed in him, that what he did for you, his death, burial, resurrection, impacts your life, and you invite him in. You repent saying, God, I fall so short. I'm a sinner for all have sinned and fall short of the doxa, the glory, the perfection of God. And the wages of that falling short, what we call hamartia, sin is hamartia. The wages, the paycheck you earn for not coming up as a perfect person is necros, eternal death, separated from everything that you love. Oh, but the gift of God. Oh, the wonderful gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So when he places you in Christ, you step in a relationship with him. Here's what happens spiritually, what happens? All the wrath of God, because see, God in his nature, his foundational character is love. But that love is balanced by his justice. God is just not love. That's why love is not God. Because God is so much more than love. He's also justice. Oh, no, I thank God that he brings justice. But that means he's going to judge us. And in his justice, we will be judged short of his standard. But when you step into a relationship with Jesus Christ, you're no longer short of his standard. Jesus meets the standard for you on your behalf. And when he climbed on that cross... God the Father exhausted all of his wrath, all of his justice, all of his judgment on Jesus for your shortcomings and mine. And he buried, it pummeled Jesus. It killed him. 
But he didn't stay dead. He is the God who is alive. There is no other God that's alive. And he is among us today, and he's right near to you. And some of you, he's whispering in your ear right now, I am talking to you. I have something for you. I have this gift of love in Christ for you. Won't you please take that next step of faith into relationship with me? He's whispering in your ear. Jesus died and he rose again, taking all the justice of God on your behalf. So there is no more justice or judgment aimed towards those who are in Christ Jesus. So what do you have to worry about? God is taking care of your life from here on out. He's on the throne. and He can handle it. God is never, ever surprised by anything. Amen? Amen. So how you were loved determines a lot about your view of yourself now. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15, it says that Jesus died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. That's the hallmark of being a believer, is to be selfless, to be a servant, to be others-centered Luke 9, 23, Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And it's only through the power and the presence of Jesus Christ, the power and the presence of God, the Holy Spirit in your life, that you can pour out on others this love as you experience his love toward you. It is so different than the love you grew up with. It's so different. Let me go back to some of the book. Uh, Dr. Jennings says, an unhealthy parent sends mixed signals of approval slash disapproval. The child doesn't know if they're being approved or disapproved of or what. It's just mixed. And so they have this, this uh, lack of settling. They just don't know. They're, they're confused. And, and this, this mixed signals triggers insecurity in the child. And the conflicting signals cause the child to fail to develop a healthy internal sense of self. And watch this. And instead, train the child to continue to look to the parents for external validation. And this results in an overly intense longing for love, affirmation, and acceptance. This is why, this is why so many middle schoolers are going into relationships as if they're getting married. As if they're, this is the give all, end all. Because they are so in need of validation, they're so longing for affirmation, for someone to approve of them, they're willing to do anything if you'll just accept me. Well, they go Facebook official in sixth and fifth and fourth grade because they're not getting it at home. And so they're seeking other... It's a fact that those that are adopted are in foster care because they did not get the love of Jesus or a sustainable, healthy love. They disconnect. They disconnect. Why? Because they don't see themselves as worthy. I will never forget a young man and praise God what God has done in his life since that day has been unbelievable. It's another amazing story of the power of God. The aliveness of God. I'll never forget, two years ago at a Unite conference, there was a man, young man about 17 years old kneeling down here. Everybody had left to go get pizza. I walked up to him. I began kneeling and praying over him, and this young man was just in tears. And on the outside, he had everything going for him, everything. Good-looking, charismatic. He had a family that just gave him their last name, loved him. And you want to know what he told me? I said, what's wrong? You okay? He said, Pastor Ed, I blew it. I blew it. I pushed them away. They loved me. They accepted me. But I disconnected with them because I'm not worthy of their love. That young man is now living for Jesus. He's not perfect, amen? But mine, mine, his, the love of God shed abroad in his heart is teaching him what real love is. 
And the fact of the matter, what Dr. Jennings would say and what all clinical psychologists would say is this. When a child grows up in an environment like that, they cannot recognize God's true love. They're trapped in a cycle of dysfunction. (laughs) And it's only, only the love of God, unconditional, inexhaustible, immeasurable, deep-reaching, unconditional love of God that can break through that cycle. Many of you here today know what I'm talking about. You had a dad, a mom that was an addict. They were not healthy enough to give you the kind of love that you needed as a child. And you hear about the kind of love that God gives, and then you see church people and you go, I can't believe in that. I'm here to tell you, it's true. God can love you back to health. He can rewire your mind, set a foundation for your life that's only found in Jesus Christ that can bring you out of the trap. You don't have to stay disconnected. And the cycle will continue if you do not discover who Jesus is and the power of his love and his kind of love alone. The cycle will just continue. Some of you will go through divorce after divorce after divorce because of the way you were raised and still not recognize it. It's like you're thinking that you can get milk from a bowl and you go back to the bowl time and time and time and time again and you cannot be successful because you're beating your head up against the wall. Bulls don't give milk. But you so need that love. Dysfunctional families don't give that kind of love because they didn't get it themselves. I know, I remember Arnold BFW Hall, six packs of Michelob Light bottles in my dad's van. There he was again. I was so angry, I was so mad. He wouldn't give me what I needed. Went up there that night knowing he was there, and I took all those Michelob Light bottles and I ran over and chunked them in the woods. Then I went back to his van and picked up another two six packs, chunked them into the woods, hearing those bottles crack and break, thrilled my heart. I was so angry. I wanted someone to love me. And my dad got gloriously saved. Wow, you talk about life change. Wow, wow. Whew, incredible. I got to lead him to Christ, got to baptize him. And the love of God shed abroad in his heart like no other love that you've ever experienced. It's real. Because he's real. Won't you take that step towards him today?